Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Clara Maurova. Clara was nicknamed to be the cannibal mother and was one of three involved in the Kurum case. Basically, Clara met someone who convinced her to join this kind of a cult that was led by someone who was called the doctor. After joining this cult, that same woman, who was called Barbara, started to convince Clara to commit certain crimes against her own family. A lot of these crimes are one that I unfortunately cannot even repeat here on YouTube. These crimes continued on for a year until somehow a neighbor of Carla's bought a nanny cam that was on the same frequency as one that Carla was using, and the neighbor's camera's feed ended up getting intercepted with Carla's, and this neighbor saw some of the crimes happening and took the evidence to the police. Thankfully, this was enough for the police to come and take Clara into custody and charge her. The boys involved were able to testify at the trial as well. In our number 9 spot today, we have Irma Grease. I don't care if I say any of these names right, they all suck. Irma was given the nickname the Hyena of Auschwitz, and I think that really speaks for itself. She was a concentration camp guard and even went on to serve as warden of the women's section of Bergen-Belsen. There are many accounts of Irma and the crimes she committed and they are all absolutely horrific. It is said that she was particularly cruel and stirred panic and fear in every prisoner that crossed her path. Apparently she even had a lampshade that was made out of the skin of three separate prisoners just as an example of how depraved she really was. These crimes caught up with her in the end however as in the spring of 1945 she was arrested along with 45 other people. She was accused of war crimes and although she pleaded not guilty, the testimonies of witnesses and strong survivors allowed the truth to come out. She was convicted and sentenced to death, which occurred on December 13th, 1945. In our number 8 spot today we have Leonarda Cianciulli. Better known as the soap maker of Correggio, Leonarda was an Italian serial killer who lived from 1883 until 1970. There are certainly people on this list who took more lives or did what could be considered more brutal things but these crimes are absolutely chilling. Leonardo took the lives of three separate people and turned them into soap and tea cakes using caustic soda. Leonardo's son went to join the Italian army in preparation for World War II, and during this time, she figured the only way to protect him was by doing human sacrifices. One of the worst parts of these crimes is that she fed these tea cakes she made to people who would come to visit along with eating them herself and feeding them to her son. Authorities caught on to her crimes when one of her victim's family members began to get suspicious about the disappearance. In the end, Leonardo was arrested and charged and ended up being convicted to 30 years in prison and 3 years in a criminal asylum. In our number 7 spot today we have Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth was a Hungarian noblewoman who lived from August of 1560 to August of 1614. While she was born into one of the oldest and most powerful families in Transylvania and was well educated and successful, she was also killing young women and bathing in their blood. Yeah, super weird and really not not cool at all. Elizabeth has gone down as one of the most evil women in history because she was taking the lives of women who were her servants and she was bathing in their blood because she believed it would keep her young. There's something that's telling me that this probably didn't work. I guess somebody should have told her about drinking water and leaving other people alone. It's way more efficient. Anyway, instead of being remembered as youthful and beautiful, Elizabeth is instead remembered as being a terrible evil person who took the lives of somewhere from 175 to 200 women, but some account swear the number might be as high as 600. In our number 6 spot today we have Herda Oberhauser. Herda was a German physician and convicted war criminal who performed absolutely horrific medical atrocities on prisoners at the Ravensbrück women's concentration camp. She was known for being a part of medical experiments like treating purposely infected wounds with sulfenamide as well as bone, muscle and nerve regeneration and transplantation. Herda was the only female that was a defendant in the Nuremberg doctors trial and she was convicted for crimes against humanity, but was only sentenced to 20 years in prison. She was released early for good behavior somehow, and ended up becoming a family doctor again in West Germany. That was until a survivor recognized her. Her then had her medical license revoked and was fined. She tried to appeal but was rejected and never practiced medicine ever again. In our number 5 spot today we have Myra Hindley. Myra is a woman who was in a relationship with a man called Ian Brady. Together this couple has been referred to as quote, two sadistic killers of the utmost depravity, and individually, Myra has been called the most evil woman in Britain. Between July of 1963 and October of 1965, these two together took the lives of five separate people. The pair were only charged for three killings, but both received life sentences under a whole life tariff. After being arrested, she of course tried to pin all of the crimes on Ian and make up excuses for the crimes, like saying that she was running a bath while one of them took place, so what was she supposed to do? 
do. Luckily, somehow the judge was able to see through this ironclad self defense. She ended up making several appeals against her life sentence and claimed that she was a reformed woman, but for some reason, no one believed that and she was never released. We have Carla Homolka. Carla is one of the worst Canadians out there. Carla, along with her partner Paul Bernardo, are often referred to as the Ken and Barbie killers. And while Paul started off his life of crime alone initially, he quickly brought Carla into it as well as the crimes only progressed and got worse. After being found out, Paul was arrested and charged for his crimes prior to their relationship, and together the pair was charged with taking the lives of three separate people, one of them being Carla's own sister. The investigation of the crimes was quite difficult and complicated, and unfortunately there was no choice but to offer Carla a plea deal. If she fully cooperated with the investigation, she would receive only a 12 year sentence in return, and she accepted. Both Paul and Carla were convicted in 2005, and while Paul still remains in prison, Carla served her 12 year sentence and has since been released. She left Canada for a while, but unfortunately has since returned. In our number 3 spot today we have Isle Cook. Isle was a war criminal who oversaw concentration camps that were run by her husband, Carl Otto Cook. She is well known due to her sadistic and brutal treatment of prisoners, and she became one of the first well known people that committed these types of crimes to be tried by the US military. It is said that those being held at the camps with distinctive tattoos, Isle would take pieces of their skin as souvenirs. When being charged with her crimes, they included things like private enrichment, embezzlement, as well as taking the lives of some prisoners to prevent them from testifying. In the original trial, she was acquitted for lack of evidence, although her husband was sentenced to death by an SS court in Munich. After a few more trials, however, she ended up being sentenced to life in prison, and despite multiple appeal attempts, she was never released. In our number two spot today, we have Daria Nikolaevna Saltyakova. That's the best we're gonna get. Daria was a Russian noblewoman and a serial killer from Moscow. She became well known for killing many of her serfs, mostly women, which is kind of similar to Elizabeth, who we already talked about today. Because of her ties to the Russian royal court and other Russian nobility, complaints about the deaths at her estate were initially ignored and only resulted in punishments for those who did the complaining. Eventually, however, relatives of those who had been killed were able to bring a petition to Empress Catherine II, who then decided to try Daria publicly. Investigations took six long years, where the investigating official counted up to 138 suspicious deaths, basically all of which could likely be attributed to Daria. In the end, she was found guilty of 38 of these crimes, but the Empress wasn't quite sure what the punishment should be, as the death penalty had already been abolished in Russia. In the end, Daria was chained on a public platform and made to wear a sign around her neck that detailed the crimes she committed. After this form of punishment, she was sent to jail to serve out her life sentence. In our number one spot today, we have Delphine LaLaurie. Delphine was a New Orleans socialite who was an evil person behind closed doors. It is said that in public, Delphine was polite and appeared as if she cared for those who were enslaved in her home, which is the most ridiculous sentence I've ever said, but that's what the accounts of people who lived at this time said. Delphine's social standing remained until, on April 10th, 1834, authorities responded to a fire at her Royal Street mansion. When they arrived and went inside, no one was prepared for the horrors they were about to see as they discovered bound slaves in her attic who had clear signs of violent behavior over a long period of time. Following this, her house was swarmed by an outraged group of New Orleans citizens, but somehow Delphine was able to escape with her family to France. While the angry group destroyed her entire home, Delphine never faced any punishments for her crimes, which is one of the most frustrating endings to this horrible, awful story. Coming up in our number 10 spot, we have Julia Brown. Now, Julia Brown is from a small town in Louisiana. Louisiana, and she was known to be a pretty terrifying witch in her time. She became known as a witch because she would perform spells and had charms, and yes, she would place curses on people. Yeah, this is a real person, folks. Apparently, she would perform rituals for people in the town and do spells for them, and eventually they began to take advantage of her, and that is when things took a turn. She started to tell people that bad things were going to happen to them. She would make predictions for them, such as as tell them their death dates, and that really creeped a lot of people out. She loved to sing, and at some point she created a song about how she was going to get revenge on the town when she died. When I die, I'm taking the town with me, she sang. Well, as you might have already guessed, when she died, she certainly got revenge on the town. As her casket was being lowered, rain fell on the town, and that rain eventually turned into a hurricane that wiped out the town. Yep, she might be scarier than a demon. It's possible. 
In our number 9 spot we have Maul Dyer. It is unclear if Maul Dyer was a real person or if she was just a legend. People say that she was real, however there have been no documents to prove this to date, so for the purpose of this video we are going to say she was probably real. And by real I mean a real witch, a real scary witch. Maul lived in Maryland in the 17th century. She apparently had tormentors when she was alive and put a curse on them before she died. She died running away from them and froze to death on a rock that the town still displays today as apparently you can still see her handprint on the rock. The ancestors of her tormentors apparently are all cursed with bad luck. Well all I can say is I would not want to marry into one of their families. <laughs> also how do we know that they are still cursed with bad luck if they are you know born and then told that they are cursed with bad luck because maybe they have attracted it now because they believe that they have bad luck. I say those people need to leave the town, forget this legend, and see if the next generation has bad luck and then we will have proof if this curse has actually continued. Maul was spoken about in the famous movie The Blair Witch Project in which I have not seen but probably should. In our number 8 spot we have Kate Batts. This is probably one of the scariest witches on this list. Kate Batts was a neighbor to a man named John Bell and apparently was a witch tormenting John and his family from her grave. Very powerful. John and his daughter Betsy were tormented in many different ways. Betsy was attacked apparently by an unknown force and they would both hear chain sounds and always feel on edge. Eventually the entity that was tormenting them told them that she was their former neighbor Kate Batts and that she was going to destroy their family. Eventually John was found dead with a small vial of liquid beside him believed to be poison from Kate the entity. Apparently she stopped tormenting the family after John passed. Why she was tormenting the family is unknown but perhaps it was because John did something bad to her when she was alive. That's the only explanation I can think of. Perhaps his guilty conscience could have concocted the whole story. That feels possible as well. In our number 7 spot we have Gerald Gardner. Known as the creator of Wicca, a religious version of witchcraft, Gerald Gardner is arguably scarier than a demon to some, but perhaps just an egotistical man to most. In 1954 he wrote a book called Witchcraft Today and it became widely popular around the world and it helped pay the way for more widespread acceptance of witchcraft. So even though that has done a lot of good for the community, he is a bit of a controversial character that may have caused harm as well. A lot of people are angry at the fact that he became known as the founder of Wicca when he himself did not actually find it. He just wrote a book about it and then got credited for it. This has angered many witches around the world and many people are frustrated that he has claimed the title of founder when he indeed is not. <laughs> Nobody likes a faker and it does not do any good for the religion to have its leader be dishonest. Coming up in our number 6 spot we have La Voisine. Catherine aka La Voisine was a witch in the 1600s in France who would do spells, mix potions, and tell fortunes to the townspeople. Apparently she would hold black masses and she would channel the devil. She really grew to fame when she discovered that a lot of wives wanted their husbands to pass away and so she created potions to help them do so. She gained quite a bit of fortune from these potions. After some time she became more and more dark as she began to take the lives of innocent people as a sacrifice for the devil and eventually she was arrested for killing many people and she was you know burned at the stake. This woman seems absolutely terrifying and I am so glad that I live in 2000. 22 and not the 16th century. Definitely seems more terrifying than a demon. On second thought, perhaps she was actually one. <laughs> in our number 5 spot we have Agnes Sampson. Agnes was a well known healer in her time which was around 1590 when the king of Scotland single handedly started the witch trials around the world due to his paranoia over witches and his belief that a witch was the cause for a few big storms in Scotland. Talk about paranoid. Heesh. <laughs> Anyways, Agnes was one of the witches that was captured during this time and tortured and thrown in jail. She was known for her healing potions that worked like magic and so naturally she was accused of being a witch. They didn't have natural paths back then, so there's that. Anyways, turns out they were right to accuse her because while in jail she actually confessed and said that she worshipped Satan and that she even was physically involved with him, if you catch my drift. So yeah, after this she was 
sentenced to death. In our number four spot, we have Anne Hibbins. In the 1650s, there was a woman by the name of Anne Hibbins who was accused of being a witch. And perhaps she was, but maybe not in the typical way like the others on this list. Perhaps she was just not a great person and her personality was scarier than a demon and she perhaps got what she deserved. Apparently, Anne was a very wealthy woman, being very connected, and her brother in law was a future governor of Massachusetts, and her husband was a civil law officer. Her husband apparently condemned a woman for being a witch. When he passed away, she was left a bit in ruin and she wasn't very well liked. She had sued a bunch of carpenters years prior that her community loved, and that made people hate her. She was then accused of being a witch and sentenced to death. There's not too many reports on her, so it's hard to say if she really was a nasty woman or not, but if she was, then all I can say is this sounds like the case of Queen Karma herself. In our number three spot, we have Alice Keitler. Alice Keitzler was one of the first witches known in Ireland. She apparently was married four times and outlived all of her husbands. Yep, of course that was unusual for this period, which was the 13th century. All of her husbands died mysteriously, and after every one, people grew more and more suspicious of her, naturally. Until her final husband died, then his kids accused her of poisoning him. Eventually, rumors began to spread that she had killed her husbands as offerings to the devil himself. She also wasn't very well liked in the town, so that didn't help her case either. But apparently she had been worshipping him for decades. People began pushing for her to be captured and to have a formal trial, but before they were able to, she fled the country. That's proving that she probably did kill her husbands. She might not have been a witch, but it's definitely possible she was. In our number two spot, we have Malin, Matt's daughter. Malin and her husband were either evil or they were being possessed because because their story really gives me the creeps. In 1676, Malin's husband was sentenced to death for being inappropriate with an animal. Ah, uh, this makes me sick. And Malin was accused of being a witch by her own daughter. Her daughter said that she would worship the devil. Apparently, many young ones went missing in her town, and people believed that she snatched them and sacrificed them. At her trial, she was accused of taking them, and since her daughter was among the accusers, she had no chance. She was sentenced to death. She died without a sound, which confirmed to many that she was a real witch because they apparently don't feel pain. Guys, maybe she was. A real witch. If I get too close to the oven and feel the heat, I react. So if I was her, I would have made my exit the most dramatic show anyone would ever see. So dramatic people would laugh and wish they hadn't burned me. <laughs> In our number one spot, we of course have Alistair Crowley. Not all witches are women, folks. Probably the worst witch that I have ever read about was a male, and he was the darkest they come. People called him the wickedest man to have ever existed, scarier than a demon. In fact, he was probably Satan himself. Of course, I'm speaking of Alistair Crowley, who was alive not too long ago. Close to a hundred years ago, he was being kicked out of Italy for his occult gatherings, where it is believed that he channeled Satan and everyone danced naked under the moon. Such fun. <laughs> he would refer to himself as the Beast or the Antichrist. He traveled around the world promoting his religion called Thalma and promoted his teachings. He wrote many books including the Book of Thoth, the Book of Lies, and the Book of the Law. The scary thing about Alistair is that people still follow his teachings today. Starting us off at number 10 is a classic witch. First up we have a story from Louis 92 and they start off by explaining explaining that their grandfather used to be a rancher in Mexico, and that this was a story he used to tell often when they were young. Quote, One day he said he was patrolling this ranch late at night, and he heard a baby crying. Now, the land is pretty flat, so he looked always and saw nothing. Maybe some goats out in the far distance since they sound like crying babies. As he's walking his route, he hears the same sound, looks up in the sky, and he swears he saw a witch with black clothing and everything flying towards a mountain. He panicked, ran to his car, and drove off as fast as he could. I mean, no kidding. If I saw a witch riding a broom in the sky while I was alone at night, I would definitely 
definitely be freaked out too. Moving on to number nine, a coven. Next up is a story posted to Reddit about nine years ago from Astrius94, and it would definitely freak me out to say the least. Quote, about five years ago, me and my friends were just messing around in a smallish local forest. Basically, we saw in the distance, in a little forest clearing, a group of four, five, six-ish people, what looked like to be wearing black hooded robes sitting together on the ground quietly. I know it seems typical, but there was no normal reason for anyone to be dressed like that in the middle of a forest. We just all freaked out and ran after watching for about 20 seconds. I still remember the image of them sitting there vividly all these years later. Coming in at number eight, a psychic witch. This next one comes from Reddit user Bubblegum Scent, and they begin by explaining she knew a woman who lived in the middle of nowhere, really far from town. She went to her one day with her mom. Quote, this woman was eerie, that energy that also scares you because you think she can see through you, but there was nothing wrong with her face or hair or anything. She was average looking, except for her gold grills all around her mouth. She first did a ritual with water and green leaves from a mango tree on us, chanting some stuff we didn't understand and passing these leaves in the fire. She said she needed to clean us of energy from the outside. Reddit friend explains that she's a very private person, so she hadn't shared any details with the woman when she arrived, but when this witch opened her cards, Reddit friend freaked out. Quote, this woman opened her cards and she saw and pointed out skin color, height, eye color, and profession of every single love and in my life at the time, and which ones were in love, and others which were badly intentioned. I was spooked the whole time. This woman knew about travels and work prospects and everything. It was scary. Coming in at number seven, Manchek Swamp. During the 1860s, Julia Brown was a well-respected healer and midwife who resided in a small village called Frenier. At first, she loved caring for her village, but after some time, she started to feel disrespected by her community, feeling as though they were taking her gifts for granted. Julia began scaring the village, telling them dooming predictions about their impending deaths, and the townspeople, unsure if she was placing a curse or foretelling their future, became very troubled. Shortly before her own death, she said, One day I'm gonna die and I'm gonna take you all with me. And just days after she was buried, three entire villages were destroyed by a hurricane and hundreds of lives were lost. To this day, many believe the spirit of Julia Brown haunts the swamp, and visitors who have visited report hearing blood-curdling screams and the sound of her voice singing cryptic and frightening songs, terrifying all those who walk by. Coming in at number six, Alice's grave. Alice died in the 19th century, and although she led a fairly normal life while alive, her death and afterlife were anything but. She was laid to rest in an above-ground grave but soon after, many of the townspeople began to question, was Alice a witch? It said in the middle of the night, the large slab of marble covering her grave was removed on three separate occasions, and each time her remains were left outside of her grave. No one stepped forward admitting to have moved Alice or the slab, which led the people to believe that Alice was a witch trying to escape her grave and haunt the town. Eventually, large, heavy iron bars were placed over the grave in an attempt attempt to hold her spirit inside, but this hasn't seemed to stop her as locals claim you can still see her wandering the wooded cemetery at night. But just exactly what is she looking for? That is one of the many unanswered questions that leave visitors terrified, unsure if she comes in peace or if she is out for revenge. Moving on to number five. Bell Witch Cave. One of the most well-known haunted locations, the tales of it being haunted by an evil entity go back as far as the early 1800s and have been very well documented throughout the years. As the story goes, sometime in the late 16th century, there was a huge feud between two neighbors, John Bell and Kate Batts. Now, Kate believed that John had cheated her somehow on a land deal, and so to seek revenge would routinely harm his daughter. This, of course, made John act out, and the two spent most of their lives trying to get back at one another. In fact, she was so hell-bent on revenge that the feud even lasted until her very dying breath. On her deathbed, Kate, who was believed by all in the town to be a witch, allegedly cursed the entire Bell family and promised she would haunt them for the rest of eternity. Ever since that day, 
a terrifying entity is said to haunt the cave. Even Andrew Jackson, former president who spent a night there, once famously said, I would rather face the entire British army than to spend another night with the Bell Witch. Coming in at number 4, a satanic idol. In 1991, a hunter was walking through the woods on the lookout for deer when he began to feel an overwhelming sense of paranoia. At that very moment, he turned around to see this creepy doll leaned up against a tree staring at him and he could have sworn that it appeared out of nowhere. Immediately, the hunter knew he should not be here and so he began walking as quickly as he could to find a way out of the forest. Then suddenly, an old man dressed in black robes appeared beside him. He looked like a priest, the hunter thought, but something wasn't quite right. Every step he took, the priest matched him, but eventually he decided to ask the priest how to get out of the forest. Creepily, the priest did not speak, instead just pointed off into another direction, turned around, and left the man alone. Now, luckily, the hunter escaped, and the following day, after telling his friends the strange events, they suggested that he reach out to Ed and Lorraine Warren. Upon telling them his story, they explained that the priest was actually a well-known member of a satanic cult, and that the creepy doll he encountered was actually an idol used for ritual purposes. Then the Warrens, being who they were, ventured back into the forest, found the doll, and brought it back home. Soon after, however, strange things began happening. Allegedly, one time Ed was speaking with Lorraine, turned away for a second, looked back, and she was suddenly 30 feet away and passed out on the ground. He called the ambulance, and she spent the next three days in hospital, in and out of consciousness, and according to Ed, she actually levitated. Moving on to number three. Bear Walker. Next up is a story from a now deleted Reddit account about the time they came into contact with a bear walker, which in indigenous cultures is depicted as an evil sorcerer who uses sacred medicines for evil. According to our friend here, quote, I was 20 years old and very healthy. One night I had a dream I was in a field and was picking wildflowers. From each direction, a tornado was coming at me. I woke up in a fevered sweat. That began two months of sheer misery. My doctor kept saying that I had a UTI, she would give me antibiotics, and it would subside for a while. I lost 40 pounds in the span of two months. By the end of it, I couldn't walk and barely ate. Reddit user says her family grew concerned and convinced her to go to a hospital, and after an ultrasound, they found a huge growth on her ovary. The user continues, quote, a few days later, I had surgery, and when the doctor came to visit me, he said, he had never seen anything like it. It was a yellow, almost concrete-like substance around my ovary. I got better, but my mother remained unconvinced and scheduled an appointment with a medicine man. According to Reddit user, the medicine man said a woman saw her at a powwow, became interested in who she was because of her mother, and must have thrown a piece of medicine in the path which she stepped on. Quote, he asked me if I still felt it. I said yes. He took a bone, what kind? I'm not sure, placed it in the area and began to suck. He started vomiting yellow. He gave me medicines and rituals for my mom to do. I went home that night and slept for 13 hours. My sickness never returned. Coming in at number two, Lechuza. Our next story comes from Reddit user Zerora, and for reference, a Lechuza is a witch that transforms into an owl. Quote, I was out at a friend's ranch with my buddy, a cousin of mine, a mutual friend, and my buddy's dad. We were putting up some fence posts and barbed wire so we could corral some stray cattle and keep them there until we found the owner. The sun was setting, so we decided to call it a day. We built a bonfire close by and held up in an unfinished ranch hands house. We were drinking and just shooting the breeze and telling stories from high school. Eventually, we got to stories about the paranormal. Once I got to describing the lechuza, we heard an ungodly screech, almost ear piercing. We all turned to look in the direction of the screech, and before my eyes can adjust to the darkness, I hear my buddy scream, Es una lechuza! And he hauls 
ass to the main ranch house a few hundred yards away. I turn back towards the darkness and I see a giant silhouette of an owl perched on one of the posts we had driven in earlier that day. It was massive. Scared shitless, I decided to run back to the ranch. I finally reach the ranch house and my buddy's dad demands to know what is going on. Reddit friend tried to calm him down but eventually decided he would go to check out if the witch was still there. But when he arrived back at the tree it was perched on, the only thing left were giant claw marks. And last up in our number one spot, on the trail. Last up is a story from a now deleted Reddit account, but our Reddit friend begins by saying that they used to live in a really small town as a kid and that they would often play on the trails near the forest after school with their friends. Quote, one day we were walking a trail and a lady in her mid 50s or 60s came out of the woods. She had dirt all over her hands and pants. She said her car broke down and she needed help. We said we would go tell our parents to come help, but she insisted did we come into the woods. We said no and kept walking and she just stared at us. It was like she just shut off as a person when we told her. The smile went away. Even when we were a couple kilometers down the road, we could see her staring at us. Anyways, we get back to my friends and we're playing tag or something in his backyard. And one of us starts making fun of the lady we saw earlier and out of nowhere, he is launched into his parents' shed, breaks the window and his arm. We all stand in shock. His parents come out and start yelling at us, blaming us and saying, we threw him. To this day, we all seem to have the same recurring dream or seeing the woman in the woods, except every time I dream it, she is closer and closer to us. Starting us off at number 10 is Queen Rani Lakshmi Bai, also known as Rani of Chansi. Born in 1828, this Indian queen ruled over the state of Chansi during the 1850s. She was a central figure during the 1857 Indian Rebellion, and most people know her as India's Joan of Arc. And if you know Joan's story, Story, then you already know she was a bad ass. She would wrestle, weightlift, and steeplechase all before breakfast, which was amazing for a female to be doing in the 1800s. Rani wasn't born into royalty, but she married into it when she wed the Maharaja Gangadhar Rao Navalkar in 1842. The couple had a son who died within months, so they adopted one of the Maharaja's sons as their own. After the king died, British officials refused their adopted son's claim to the throne and wanted to annex Chansey. Rani was like, hell no, I'm not giving you my life. And when the rebellion against the British started, there was a massacre of 40 to 60 European officers, and it's still debated whether the Queen was directly involved in it or not. Her forces did later defeat the mutineers during the siege when the place was going to up, she rode off on her horse with her son on her back. The horse died, but they somehow survived. In June, a squadron came down on them and she actually dressed up as a cavalry soldier and killed some troops. She was already wounded without a horse and just bleeding on the road before a troop came and shot her to death. Now, I don't think Rani was an evil queen per se. She loved her people and fought for them, but I'm sure in the British view at the time, they thought she was evil. But maybe you shouldn't colonize half the world then, Britain. You know? Coming in at number 9 is Queen Consort Fridagunt of Soissons. There's a lot of debate whether Fridagunt was a queen, a woman that just wanted to survive, or a full on murderer. Her story is very much started from the bottom now we hear kind of vibe. She started off as King Chilperic's the first servant, then moved out to become his concubine, and finally she managed to seduce him to leave his first wife, Odovera. I know I may have pronounced that wrong, I think it's Odovera. Either way, they put her in a convent and that sucks for her. And just imagine how much control she must have had since Ozovera was powerful even without the king since she was a Merovingian queen. This is already a queen. She's taken down by a servant, concubine. But the fight wasn't over yet because in a few years, the king then married his second wife, Galswith, who was the older sister of Queen Boonhild of Metz. I'm sorry you guys, there's a lot of hard pronunciations in this video and I'm only a mere mortal. Now to get rid of her second obstacle, Frizzagund convinced the king to kill her and mere days after their wedding she was found strangled in her own bed. That obviously didn't go down well with Brunthild who then had a feud with Frizzagund for 40 years. But she didn't give a damn, she assassinated the queen's husband via poisoned axe, then tried to kill her brother-in-law the king of Burgundy, she then tried to kill their son and then she tried to kill the queen herself. So when I 
tell you this woman had no mercy or remorse, I am not exaggerating. Queen Consort Fred the Good was essential for the king since she was good at arranging discreet or not so discreet assassinations. Queen Brunhild then married Fred the Good's stepson Merovich and they tried to take the couple over. But the Queen Consort forged a secret alliance with Duke Guntram of Metz, an enemy of her husband, and kidnapped Merovich and killed him. King Chilperi just believed his son had somehow stabbed himself to death and never asked his concubine about it. I hope you guys are following. I put a lot of effort into this. Just ignore my pronunciations. At number 8 we have Queen Tamer of Georgia, born way, way back in 1160. Tamer was born into royalty since her dad was King George III of Georgia. Now, After a bloody revolt led by conspirators, George made Tamer his co-ruler in 1178, which was heavily opposed after he died. Look at the year, do you think they would have ever been okay with a woman being in charge? Absolutely not, it's 1178. She divorced her first husband after realizing he was not only gay but also also an alcoholic and this guy Yuri was so pissed he tried to stage a coup against her twice and she just swatted him away like a fly. Her second husband David supported her in every way and that's the kind of man she needed. That's the kind of man we all need. Now Tamer was sometimes called King Tamer which is very interesting. She expanded and took over her neighboring territories with no mercy. She would take her army and reduce local princes to nothing. They would siege and ransack Muslim districts and fortresses and just take them. Despite not caring about literally anyone but herself, her power and her territory, Tamer made her empire incredibly strong and stable by enacting a kind of feudal system. Hey, kudos to her for standing her ground, but you also don't have to kill everyone you see, you know? Filling at number 7 slot is Queen Zenobia. This may be the oldest queen I've mentioned in this series thus far. Born in 240 AD, this 3rd century queen's history and parentage is very much debated. Since information about her is so scarce, no one is quite sure whether she was born royal or not, but based on her level of education she was definitely not a commoner. Some sources even say she was Cleopatra's descendant which is kind of insane. She married King Septimius Odonathus who ruled over Palmyra and later the whole east and crowned his oldest son as his co-ruler. Zenobia went with them on all their campaigns and the soldiers really liked her for morale. She was probably hot, I'm not gonna lie to you. Sadly the king and his son were assassinated by their cousin after which Zenobia soon took over. Now there's some Conspiracy is claiming she was involved in planning the assassination because she didn't approve of her stepson on the throne, but some people say she was actually there when they got assassinated and she was just spared. Who knows? Septimius controlled a huge part of the Roman East and was the highest military and political authority in the region, so for Zenobia to take that over was pretty damn tough. She demanded allegiance and later invaded Egypt just to have another trade route to the river Euphrates. She didn't have to do it. The normal route wasn't completely blocked, but she just had that zeal and ambition. She appeased everyone she ruled over and was a Syrian monarch, Roman empress, Hellenistic queen who people loved. However, she kind of just declared herself empress of Rome which caused her to be called a usurper and her death very much soon followed. Now at number 6 is Qasim Sultan. Um, and I tried to google pronounce how to say this name because it is a Turkish name but I couldn't find anything so I think it's Qasim. Don't hate me if I'm wrong. Now, Kosim was one of, if not the most powerful women in Ottoman history who had a very humble beginning. Now, her dad was a priest and she was bought as a slave and sent to be a harem for Sultan Ahmed I. Kosim was his favorite and gave him multiple children, and therefore many of them were princesses, giving her power. The Sultan liked her so much that in 1612 he ordered a woman to be brutally beaten just because she had irritated his beloved. She was in power from 1605 to 1617 and first ascended to power when her son Murad IV became the Sultan. She outlived most of her male family members and had to act as regent thrice. It was said she was willing to kill anyone just to make sure her sons were on the throne, aka she was on the throne because they were all far too young. Her downfall eventually came when her daughter-in-law assassinated her in 1651. Trust no one. It's gonna be your damn own who do it. Coming in at number 5 is Elizabeth I, aka the Virgin Queen or Gloriana, which I've never heard of. Gloriana? Who's called her that? Now, as a daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, whose marriage got annulled, Elizabeth was ruled an illegitimate child. She was in prison during Mary I's reign for supposedly supporting the Protestant cause. After she finally died in 1558, Elizabeth became the queen and quickly established an English Protestant church. And the woman was actually really well liked 
like she didn't meddle too much in international affairs until war was literally knocking on her door and she was celebrated for her virginity. Even though she was low key in love with Robert Dudley her whole life, but we can just sweep that under the rug. But since Mary had made her life hell for not being a Catholic, Elizabeth abolished the Catholic Church. And despite saying she was tolerant of all religions, she was oppressing all the Catholics. Supporting Catholicism was an unlawful offence wherein the monarchy could have you beaten, imprisoned, have your property taken away or just full on execute you. She also made Mary Queen of Scots life hell since the French wanted her in power and Elizabeth obviously did not. She hated Mary since some thought Mary was the heir to the English throne since under Catholic and Protestant law Elizabeth was illegitimate. So the two just made each other's lives hell. And number 4 is Tomoe Gozen. Born around 1157, Tomoe was a onagugeisha, also known as a female warrior. It's actually debated whether she was a real historical figure or someone in literature, but I'm just going to treat her as she was real. Her father supported Lord Kiso since her family had ties to him, and she's best known for serving him during the Genpei War and in the Battle of Owazu. As beautiful as she was, she was an even more skilled archer and swordswoman. Tomoe was literally ready to face any demon or devil in her way. She'd ride untrained horses and was utterly fearless to the point Lord Kisa would send her out in battle first. Sometimes referred to as the first general of Japan, in 1182 she commanded over 300 samurai against 2,000 rival clan warriors. Her side lost the battle of Owazu and apparently she beheaded the leader of the Musashi clan and presented it to her master. I don't think she's evil at all, I think she's a full fledged badass and I'm here for it. Filling at number 3 saw is Empress Catherine the Great. Born in 1729, Catherine was the Empress of Russia for 34 years, making her the country's longest ruling female ever. Born into royalty, her dad was a German prince and her first two cousins became kings of Sweden later on. When she first arrived in Russia, no one had any idea that this random irrelevant German princess would somehow eventually marry Tsar Peter III. Now, Peter was quite unpopular since he was an alcoholic and Catherine met him at age 10 and hated him. She would stay at one end of the castle while he was on the other end. She learned Russian and became super fluent to the point she would wake up in the middle of the night and practice her lessons which gave her pneumonia. But she would do anything for the crown. Once they got married, she had a string of affairs and the palace started hating Peter more and more. Then in 1762 she launched a coup against Peter and overthrew him, becoming the queen, and later went on to assassinate him. Zam Zaddy, you literally killed your own husband for the throne! But then again, she hated him, so really, whatever. Now number two is Queen Boudicca. Now she was the queen of the British Celtic Iceni tribe, who eventually led an uprising against the forces of the Roman Empire. Boudicca was of royal parentage, and her husband Prasutigus was the king of the Iceni, which is current day Norfolk. When her husband was killed, troops from the Roman Emperor took her and tortured her. Her daughters and her tribe's money was all taken. Not taking this lightly at all, she came back with a vengeance with a hundred thousand Iceni troops and fought Legio the Ninth Hispania and killed nearly eighty thousand people. People said that she was a treacherous lioness who butchered the governors who had been left to give a fuller voice and strength to the endeavors of Roman rule. She was so close to being victorious when she was tragically captured, and instead of being killed, she killed herself. Again, I don't think Boudicca was evil in war, especially. Especially in those times, you have to kill people for your own people's sake. It's your people or your rivals, people. <laughs> and finally, at number one is Queen Maria Eleonora of Sweden. Now, born into royalty, Maria was a German princess before she married King Gustav II Adolphus of Sweden in 1620. And they were both suited to each other, you know, they had the same interests and actually loved each other, and it was more than just a political marriage. But Maria was extremely ill tempered, jealous, neurotic, and just plain dramatic. She said whatever she thought and spared no one, not even her own husband. A year after their marriage, she suffered miscarriage that made her quite depressed since she really wanted to give Gustav a son. She gave birth to a daughter who died and her third child who was a boy ended up being stillborn due to a yacht accident. Then finally in 1626 she gave birth to princess later queen Christina and due to her depression and erratic behaviour she wasn't told her gender till a few days after the birth. When she found out she said instead of a son I am given a daughter dark and ugly with a great nose and black eyes. Take her from me 
me I will not have such a monster. Bear started the multiple attempts of Mira trying to kill Christina. She once pushed her down the stairs, another time she dropped a heavy beam on her cradle, one of her nursemaids dropped her on the floor and injured her shoulder but I don't know how that was accidental. The worst was when she made Christina sleep under the rotting heart of her then dead father Gustave. This woman was a monster. Coming in at number 10, we have Sally Skull. Sally Skull was known to be a great shooter, a cusser, and a horse thief. She had a total of five husbands whom she kept for as long as they could handle her. Some divorced, while others found mysterious exits. Sally grew up tough, having to defend their farm constantly from intruders, and once watched her mother, Rachel, sorry the name. Chop off the toes of a man trying to break in. I really shouldn't relate my name to that situation, but here we are. So as a result, Sally was always ready to fight and apparently didn't take much to start gunslinging. And reportedly, she was ambidextrous and could shoot with both her right and left hand. She was also known, of course, for her horse wrangling, which wasn't always legal. In fact, most often, it wasn't. Sally would ride from Texas to Mexico there and back by herself and always come back with horses to trade and unharmed. Clearly, this was a woman who people thought twice Twice about when it came to messing with her. Coming in at number nine, we have Ma Barker. Before she became Ma Barker, she was Arizona Donnie Clark, a fiery, ill tempered, restless girl stuck in the small ways of life. But when she saw infamous outlaw Jesse James ride through town, she saw her future flash before her eyes, and boy, did she want it. Arizona married a soft spoken man named George Barker, who did nothing to fulfill her dreams besides give her four troublesome boys. But soon, her boys became one of the most iconic gangs of the West, with Ma Barker. Barker orchestrating the whole thing. The Barker Carpus gang made away with $500,000 in cash and bonds in their first bank robbery and they didn't stop there. The second robbery wasn't as clean but it solidified a murderous reputation for the group. Ma Barker soon made it to the top of the most wanted list before she died in an epic shootout with police on January 16th, 1935. Ma Barker got what she wanted in the end, adventure, a notorious reputation, and took down all those who got in her way. Coming in at number eight, we have Bell Star. Here we have another infamous name of the West, Bell Star. Most of Bell's life involved relationships with some already infamous outlaws like notorious bank train robber Jesse James, as I already mentioned. Bell's marriage to Jim Reed was the beginning of her life of crime, though. Reed and his family were constantly running from the law, and allegedly Bell joined in. Though some historians suggest that was not the case, she did take their two children and rejoined her family before Reed died in 1874. But then she met Sam Starr, a Cherokee and part of the Star Gang and there was no going back. Over the course of her marriage, legends of Belle spread across the West. She carried two pistols at all times, wore gold earrings and a man's feather brimmed hat. She was arrested several times over the course of her career, but after Sam was killed, she reformed and never even sheltered criminals ever again. When she married a third time, she didn't even defend her husband when he was accused of horse thievery. But that didn't stop someone from building a vendetta against her. The life and crimes of Belle Star came to an end when she was shot to death riding home from her friends, but to this day, no one knows who put an end to the legend. All right, coming in at number seven, we have Rachel Wall. Now, we've talked about some outlaws on land, but what about those on the sea? Rachel Wall was someone you never wanted to come across if you wanted to live a long and healthy life. Rachel loved the sea and wanted to be as close as possible, which is partly why she married a fisherman, George Wall. What drew the couple to piracy, though, no one knows, but boy, were they good at it. Whenever there was a bad storm, they would disguise their stolen ship, the Essex, and make it look like it crashed. Rachel would then pose on the ship, luring sailors nearby with cries for help, so she was kind of like the first siren. As soon as they were close enough though, they would rob and kill all of them. Over the course of the pirating career, they killed 24 sailors and robbed 12 ships accounting in $12,000 cash. But one night, their plot went horribly wrong and George was drowned at sea, leaving Rachel all alone. But she didn't stop there and instead resorted to highway robbery. You just, she just couldn't stop. She loved it. Unfortunately though for Rachel, she robbed the wrong bonnet one day and was convicted. She she was one of New England's first female pirates and the last woman to be hung in the Boston Common of Massachusetts. Coming in at number six, we have Ruth Eisman Shear. Coming in closer to modern day, Ruth Eisman Shear, one of the few women to make it onto the FBI's most wanted list. Her and her boyfriend at the time kidnapped a rich heiress named Barbara Mackle and ransomed her for $500,000. Keep in mind, this was in the 1960s, so that may not seem like a ton of money to go through kidnapping someone now, but it was back then. But they didn't just tie her up in a basement and leave her for days or something like that. No, what she did was something incredible. 
incredibly terrifying. They buried Barbara alive in a coffin. Fortunately, they fed a ventilated tube into the coffin so they could keep her alive as a bargaining chip. Thankfully though, Mackle was found three and a half days later, dehydrated, starving, but still alive. Ruth's lover, Gary Christ, was arrested almost right away, but it would be 79 days until they would catch Ruth. She was arrested in Oklahoma while pretending to be a 19 year old college student, but obviously her disguise wasn't good enough. Ruth only served four of her seven years sentence before she was deported back to Honduras. Listen, anyone who can bury anyone alive sounds absolutely terrifying to me, which is why Ruth Eisman is on this list. And arriving at number five, we have Juana Barraza. Mexican wrestler turned killer, Juana Barraza's life is anything but boring. Juana had a torturous childhood, suffering from abuse from her parents, and never even learned how to read. When she finally left home, Barraza endured several failed marriages, miscarriages, and her firstborn was killed during an episode of gang violence at the age of 24. But during the 1980s, 1990s, she toured central Mexico as a masked wrestler named La Dame de Silencio, the Lady of Silence. But unfortunately, she still fell into poverty and eventually hatched a plan to steal from the elderly, which eventually evolved to murder. Her and her accomplice would dress as nurses to gain access and then rob the elderly homeowner once inside. But her accomplice double crossed her, getting her corrupt police boyfriend to extort her for the money she stole in exchange for not being arrested. So she was kind of broke even then. After retiring from wrestling in 2000, Barraza became more desperate, which is when the killings began. Barraza evaded police for years as they weren't even looking for a woman, but a man. She was even on TV for an interview a week before her arrest and no one suspected a thing. The only reason she was caught was that someone saw her leave a crime scene and she was arrested right on the spot. Despite being illiterate, they found trophies and paper clippings of all the crimes she committed. She was able to evade capture and suspicion for five years and her crimes still haunt Mexico to this day. Coming in at number four, we have Margot Freshwater. This next one definitely sounds like something that belongs in Orange is the New Black. In 1970, Margot Freshwater was serving out her sentence for first degree murder in Tennessee, all female prison, but not for long. On October 4th, her and her inmate Faye Fairchild dodged armed officers escorting them and scaled the fence and caught a one-way ticket to freedom. Margot would be on the run for 32 years, only to be discovered as a grandmother of seven with two children in Idaho. But that's not even the wildest part. The way she got into prison in the first place is kind of crazy. Margot was trying to convince a lawyer to help her get her current boyfriend out of jail. She and the lawyer soon began an affair, but the thing was, the lawyer was kind of paranoid that people were after him. So what did he do? They went on a crime spree, killing two convenience store clerks and a cab driver. The lawyer was committed to a mental asylum, but Margo was convicted of murder for all three crimes, even though she claimed he forced her to. Still, after she escaped and 32 years on the run, she was placed back in prison in 2002, only serving time until she was released in 2011. We're arriving at our top three now, guys, so if you do like this video, tell us. Press the little button that looks like this down there, and then we'll keep going. Coming in at number three, we have Griselda Blanco, a woman you would never want to cross paths with. If you did, you probably wouldn't live to tell the tale. Also known as the Black Widow and the Queen of Cocaine, Griselda was a central figure in the drug wars of America during the 1970s and 80s. She trafficked cocaine with the Mendelin cartel in high profile areas like Miami, Florida, New York, and Southern California. She was said to be an absolutely ruthless killer and while authorities only convicted her for 40 deaths, there is reason to suspect her number hits over 200. She was also notorious for murdering her husbands over trivial matters, but especially over money. But her bloodlust didn't stop there. Griselda was known for holding all female orgies where she would execute all the strippers afterward for pleasure. Blanco had the DEA on her trail for years, but she always managed to cleverly evade them. That is, until she was finally caught in 1985. Still, she was able to strike a deal and only serve 15 years in prison for her crimes. Some even say there was some manipulation of the trial when it came to those who testified. But after Griselda was released in 2004, someone still had it out for her and she was assassinated after she was deported to Colombia at the age of 69. This woman was 100% lethal and the last person you would have wanted to be stuck in a room with. Coming in at number two, we have Hazel Leota Head. Now for an outlaw who is still on the run today. Hazel Leota Head is wanted for the murder of widower Charles Barker in 1998. Imagine if someone watching this is like, oh wait, I saw her at the grocery store yesterday. Charles Barker had recently lost his wife of 11 years due to a drunk driver and fell into a deep depression. He spent a lot of the insurance money gambling and drinking, which is where he got the attention of Hazel Liotta Head, or Deanna Ray, as he would know her. Within a few days, she moved in with him. His family was excited that he'd met someone, but after meeting her, daughter Jennifer was like, hmm, yeah, she's after your money, dad. And Charles was like, 
Yeah, I think she is too. Don't worry, I'll, I'll talk to her about it. She never heard from him again and was found with a bullet in the back of his head. Hazel, nowhere to be seen. His gun was wiped clean, the safe was entirely empty, which meant $45,000 were missing, and his car was found at an airport with DNA on the seat that identified Deanna as Hazel. Hazel reportedly had been married over 10 times and used alias after alias for each of them. She is wanted also for arson, theft, and now murder. Hazel would be 72 years old today and counting, so if you spot her, tell someone. Probably a good idea. Coming in at number one, we have Ching Shi. From prostitute to pirate lord, Ching Shi was one of the most infamous pirates to rule the high seas. Highly organized, ruthless, and precise, Ching Shi eventually ruled over as many as 50 to 70,000 pirates in her lifetime. While working as a prostitute, she caught the eye of already famous pirate captain of the Red Flag fleet, Cheng Yi. There are multiple accounts as to how they got together, but both versions involve the captain proposing to her. She said yes, but not before she negotiated that they would share the power of the fleet and any plunder. Together they grew the fleet from 200 ships to 1800 and categorized their fleet by colors, red being in the lead, the others being black, yellow, white, and blue. But only six years into their marriage, Sheng Yi died and Qing Shi stepped into the role wholeheartedly. She ran a tight ship handing out fierce punishments to all those who disobeyed the code. She was strict with her prisoners, keeping her men in check should any woman be taken in. Should they take a wife? Fine. But they had to remain faithful, if not, dead. If they took a woman against her will, dead. Any who deserted would be hunted down, tortured, then killed. The Red Fleet eventually felt like a floating country, even routinely taxing villages. She earned the name the Terror of South China, and soon the Chinese government realized they couldn't defeat her, so they made a bargain. A bargain that allowed her to retire wherever she liked and bathe in her riches. There's actually so much to this story, but for now, I think we can all agree she would have been the last person you wanted to see on the horizon. Coming in at number 10, I'm waiting for this one to be made in some kind of like epic sexy ancient Roman spy movie because starting at number 10 we have Mistress Marcia. Mistress Marcia was responsible for the demise of Roman Emperor Commodus, but not only was she his assassin, she was also his most favored concubine. Talk about keeping your enemies closer, eh Marcia? Marcia Aurelia Chionia Demetrius, along with most of Rome, wasn't a fan of this great leader. He was arrogant, would kill off his officials randomly, and try to rename Rome after himself. But Marcia was skilled at managing his temper and even convinced him to release the Christian sentence to labor in the Sardinian mines. But in 192 AD, Commodus wanted to appear next to the gladiators instead of the traditional place all rulers took in the palace. Marcia tried to convince him how much that would offend Rome, but Commodus took that as a slight and instead of brushing it aside, condemned her to death the following morning. Overreaction. Enraged, Marcia leapt into action once she discovered his plan. It was typical of the mistress to feed the emperor wine after his bath every night, so she enlisted the help of two conspirators and poisoned the cup. Unfortunately, it only made him violently ill and not dead, so they paid an athlete to strangle him to death. Marcia then married her fellow slave and lover Eclectus before they were both caught and killed a year later for the crime. Still, took him a year to figure it out. Not bad, Marcia. Julia Tofana. This next woman found a deadly way to help young maidens escape unwanted marriages. Back at a time when women had no social or financial protection if they did not have a man beside them, many young ladies were used as pawns to negotiate wealth and status for their families, even unwillingly. Which meant many had no protection should they be trapped in an abusive marriage, which is where our home ec assassin comes in. Born in Palermo, Italy, Julia sold poisons that were effective in helping divorces come along by let's say, natural causes. Though not much is known about the woman herself, Julia would become one of the most famous hit women in history for providing a poison called aqua tofana. Disguised as a necessary tonic for women to use, the substance was a combination of arsenic, belladonna, and lead, all of which were actually found in makeup. <laughs> Oops. Belladonna was used to expand the pupils so women would look more alluring, for example. But Aqua Tofana was the perfect tasteless and odorous concoction to pour into husband's end of the day ale. She kept a steady business for 50 years, long enough to involve her daughter before she was discovered. One of her clients apparently had second thoughts before pouring her husband some soup and that eventually revealed the scheme. Julia killed over 600 men before the death of her and her accomplices. Coming in at number eight, Charlotte Corday, the assassin of Marat. If you paid attention to history class, you know how bloody and ruthless the French Revolution was. 
Heads flew everywhere, the prisons were filled with nobles, riders filled the streets. Needless to say, it wasn't a great place to be, but Charlotte Corday had a mission. Charlotte was a passionate supporter of the revolution, even though its main conspirators were set on killing the likes of her. Charlotte was, after all, a noblewoman, though she opposed the reign of terror. There were two sides to the fray, the Girondists and the Jacobins, and Charlotte fought along the first. But the Jacobins were radical and tried to kill any and all oppositionists, the Girondists included. Which is why Charlotte decided that Jean-Paul Marat, leader of the Jacobins and journalist, had to get the hell out. You gotta admire her gumption, man, because she just stormed in while this guy was taking a bath. She bought a knife, disguised herself as an informant, and went in to speak to him. At first she delivered on her offer and told him of escaped Girondins, but he had once said that they should be guillotined, <laughs> so she whipped out her knife and ended his bath time once and for all. Corday knew she was going to be caught, however, and had told not even her family of her plans. Charlotte was guillotined on July 17, 1793, with her name attached to her dress so she would be recognized. She wrote in a letter explaining her actions. I desire only that my head carried through Paris may be a rallying standard for all the friends of the law. That's commitment right there. Next up, at number seven, we have Idoya Lopez Riano, also known as La Tigresa, the Tigress. Man, wicked names. Make it so hard not to think they're bad. I mean, they killed people. That's bad. The Tigress was a leading commander in a deadly political group aimed at earning independence of the Basque region of Spain. The group was responsible for the death of 800 people in the years before it was disbanded in 2018. She was responsible for planting a bomb in the center of Madrid in 1986, killing 12 police officers. After killing five more police a year later, at age 22, La Teresa made it onto the most wanted list. But what's even more disturbing was her tendency to seduce the police she killed before the bombings took place, even killing their colleagues across multiple days. When she was finally caught in 1994, she accumulated a sentence of 2,000 years in prison. However, she was released only 23 years later after several apologies in quitting the ETA. She is now studying to be a journalist. Okay, makes you wonder, does that count as getting away with it? Coming in at number six, Brigitte Monhop. Brigitte Monhop was known at one time for being the most evil woman in Germany. She killed over nine people throughout her involvement in the West Germany far leftist terrorist group, the Red Army. In fact, she ran it. She became the head of the RAF after its four previous leaders were caught and committed suicide in jail. They orchestrated a reign of terror across West Germany in 1970s, killing over 30 people, with Brigitte being responsible for nine. She was known for her extravagant murder attempts and her cold and calculating behavior. Once she even handed a bouquet of flowers before shooting them point blank in the face. She was finally arrested in 1982 and, like Rihanna, was supposed to spend life in prison. But to the country's surprise and horror, Brigitte was released on parole in 2007 at the age of 57. Monhop has never shown remorse for any of her victims to this day, but she keeps a low profile. Next up at number five, we have an assassin who continues to work to this day, but for the other side. Kim Yeon-hui was just 19 when she was handpicked at her university to become a spy for the North Korean government. Her mission? To disrupt the Seoul Olympics in 1987 and show the world that South Korea was too dangerous to be a host. How? Well, after training for years as a spy, when Kim was just 25, she boarded a Boeing passenger plane and stored a bomb in the overhead compartment. Her and her assumed father got off at Abu Dhabi, but the bomb was detonated before it reached Seoul, killing 115 people. She says that her mission was personally assigned by Kim Jong II, and it was to help prevent South Korea from becoming more powerful than the North. She was brainwashed into thinking that this mission was for the sake of uniting Korea, and this was the very reason the president of South Korea pardoned her. Hyun Yi and her partner were intercepted and caught in Bahrain, but she didn't have time to use the cyanide like her partner did. She confessed after a week of interrogation. Today, she is married to a former South Korean spy and is the mother of two children. She is now trying to warn the world not to trust North Korea's current leader, Kim Jong Un. Due to the information she has shared, Hyun Yi thinks she's on the list to be assassinated next. Coming in at number four, this is another one that needs to be a movie. Oh wait, it is, called Hidden Man. This is a tale of epic proportions of honor, struggle, but most importantly, for this video, vengeance. In 1911, China was in turmoil while many local warlords were trying to fight for power. Shi Qin Chao's father, who had fought in the wars leading to the fall of the empire before, was captured and killed by a rival warlord named Sun Chun Feng. 
That day his fate was sealed. She plotted for years and finally set the date for November 13th, 1935. After the warlord retired, he became a Buddhist at a temple in Tianjin and she followed pistol in hand. Posed as a dedicated follower, she waited until everyone in the room had their eyes closed before she shot her father's killer. She then scattered letters and a photo of her father to assure everyone in the room that her task was complete and that she would not hurt any of them. The media caught wind of this assassination and swept up her name following words such as courageous, brave, and her case saw three trials before she was pardoned in 1936. I guess the public loves a good revenge story, but of course, who doesn't? That's why you're here. Coming in at number three, we have La Tosca, another bad name lighting up the list. Maria Lopez, also known as Latoska, was caught after completing 20 murders by the time she reached only 26 years old. She was reportedly paid $1,700 a month by the infamous Mexican drug cartel Los Zeta to complete her hit list. Los Zeta are allegedly responsible for over 14 drug selling hotspots in Monterey and are currently battling the Gulf Cartel for territory. Until her arrest in 2012, Latoska was responsible for hitting rival traffickers at any police officers that got in the way. She's also accused of a criminal cell responsible for even more crimes, including torture and carjacking. Though she definitely isn't the only female assassin involved in the cartels, she is yet to be taught for a number of kills. Coming in at number two, we have Jeanette Van Nessen. We cannot have a list of top 10 female assassins without talking about Jeanette Van Nessen. But before we do, remember to tell us you like us by pressing that thumbs up button. Now, especially over COVID, many of us may be, now be familiar with freelance work, but hopefully not this kind. Jeanette worked as a freelance assassin charging 80,000 euros per hit. Most of her kills took place in South America, but unfortunately for her, she took one hit too far. She was hired by the Black September organization to kill an Israeli intelligent agent named Carl, which she did after she she seduced him. But unbeknownst to her, as soon as she did, she put a target on her back. Abner Kaufman made it his own personal mission to take her down and eventually cornered her in her boathouse along with another agent. But she wasn't gonna go down that easy. And she slipped off her robe in an attempt to seduce Abner. But then the charade shattered when she reached for her gun. Bang, bang, they shot her down and she died holding her cat. I just think that's great. If you wanna see a dramatic presentation of this scene, just watch the film Munich, directed by Steven Spielberg. Coming in! Last but not least, number one, Freddy and Truce over Stegen. Who says the best assassins work alone? No assassin I've met, that's for sure, mostly because I haven't met any. That I know of. Sister duo Freddy and Truce over Stegen fought back against the German occupation during World War II and never revealed how many soldiers they killed. When the war was about to begin, their mother took in Jewish refugees and hid them in their house. Soon the two girls, then later along with their friend Hani, took a more deadly approach to resistance. Freddy joined the Dutch resistance when she was just 14, soon followed by Truce. In the 1940s, when the Netherlands were invaded, the three girls took on the role of ambushing and seducing SS soldiers and their Dutch collaborators straight to their death. Soon the teens began to take on shooting missions by themselves. In 1943 they met Hani, who dropped out of school when she refused to sign allegiance to Germany. All three of them became excellent shooters, but Hani was captured just three weeks before the war ended. Her last words apparently were, I'm a better shot, when her executioner only wounded her. Both Truce and Freddy survived the war and both died at the age of 92 in 2016. It was only after their deaths that they received national recognition. After all, all is fair in love and war, and these two women helped fight a war that would haunt generations to come. Mm -hmm.